so thank you very much for coming today. Uh, my name is Tom Snyder. I'm the Director of Programming Conservation Action for the Seneca Park Zoo. Uh, this is now, I believe, our, our fourth wildlife wanderings. Uh, and we're delighted to have you along, Dr. DeLong. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, and, and so, Dr. DeLong, you, uh, you're a professor at RIT. Can you give us a little bit of background about uh, what you do at RIT? And then uh, whenever you feel comfortable, go ahead and share your screen and we can get along into your presentation. Great. Well, hi, everybody. I'm a cognitive psychologist at RIT in uh, the College of Liberal Arts. And I've been at RIT about 12 years. My area of specialty is cognition and perception in animals. So I study uh, how animals learn, what they remember, how they solve problems and use tools, um, as well as their perceptual abilities, like what they can see and what they can hear. I study a wide variety of animal species, including otters, orangutans, dolphins, fish, penguins, and hopefully more in the future. I got my PhD at the University of Hawaii where I studied echolocation in dolphins and then I spent four years as a postdoc at Brown University where I studied echolocation in big brown bats. So I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my presentation. Let me stop share and now you can go ahead and do it I believe. Okay. There you go. All right, so here we are. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about what we know about vision and otters, and I want to mention uh, my collaborators. Um, first of all, Katina Wright, she is a zookeeper at the Seneca Park Zoo, and she has trained the otters um, to do the tasks in all of my studies, so I greatly appreciate her collaboration. And of course, um, dozens and dozens of RIT students who are uh, my lab assistants in the Comparative Cognition and Perception Lab who have assisted me with these research projects. So I already introduced myself and a little bit about what I do. If you are interested in learning more about my research, I encourage you to visit our lab website and I'll show that URL again at the end of the presentation. You can access uh, my studies and some descriptions of all the different research I've done uh, over the last uh, 20 years. So you might be asking yourself, why do research with otters? Well, first of all, um, we would like to contribute to conservation efforts. River otters uh, nearly disappeared from Western New York um, by the mid 20th century. And that was due to water pollution, um, the degradation of their habitats, um, too much trapping um, and other activities that threatened uh, North American river otters. Uh, luckily, in the mid-1990s, uh, they were reintroduced by capturing uh, otters from the Adirondacks and releasing them along the Genesee River. And the Seneca Park Zoo was a participant in these activities, and they were successful in getting otters to uh, come back to western New York. But there are still issues that remain for otters. We have uh, still water pollution and disappearing wetlands and beaver traps that can harm otters. And so the more we know about their perception and cognition, uh, the better we can help them in the future. And then also we have um, many, many otters residing in human care um, in zoos and aquaria, and those otters need enrichment. They need um, fun activities to do uh, to keep their senses honed um, and to help them engage in healthy foraging activities. So if you tuned in to Katina's um, talk at 10 o'clock today, you know that the zoo engages in lots of different kinds of enrichment for all of their animals um, and especially the otters. So uh, if we know more about what they can see and how they behave, then we can design even more fun enrichment devices for them. We also might uh, be able to come up with some vis uh, vision parameters that we could use um, to test otters in health assessments in the future. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we knew about vision and otters about eight years ago when I started this research. And then I'll tell you a little bit about um, a couple of experiments we've done. One is on shape and color discrimination in otters and um, one that we're in the middle of right now, which is on uh, categorization, object categorization in otters. So one way you can learn about vision and otters is by uh, observing them in their natural habitats. 
And uh, some uh, researchers have observed um, various species of otters um, capturing prey. And by the way, what otters eat includes mostly fish, but also crustaceans, some insects, um, some birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. Um, they do prefer fish, although I've, I have read that younger otters um, tend to eat more crustaceans until they graduate to being able to uh, catch fish and they may learn that from their mothers. Uh, we also know that European river otters can take up to four times as long to catch fish when they're swimming in turbid waters or murky waters compared to clear water. So if they're swimming in clear water and they can easily see the fish, then um, they're going to uh, be able to capture them much faster than if the water is murky, then they're gonna need to use their vibrissae. And you can see in the picture, their vibrissae or their whiskers um, can sense uh, vibrations underwater and they would use um, a combination of vision and that tactile sense to capture their prey. So another way we can learn more about otters is by studying otters that reside in human care and by uh, training otters to do various tasks where they have to discriminate between stimuli. And one thing you might wanna know about vision in otters is how sharp their vision is. So acuity is a measure of sharpness and you probably have had a vision test where um, an eye doctor has asked you to stand back and read a Snell and eye chart. And you see a picture of a Snell and eye chart here. And if you have 20-20 vision, then you'll be able to read line eight on that Snell and eye chart. If you're an otter, um, you would have 2200 vision. So if otters could read, I'm not saying otters can read, but if, if otters were reading a Snell and eye chart, they wouldn't be able to see line eight, they would be able to see line one. So from a certain distance away, otters can, can resolve fewer details um, in stimuli than humans. Another interesting thing about acuity is that their um, acuity is about equally as good in water, uh, underwater as it is in air. Uh, as you might have experienced swimming, you know that human visual acuity is much better in air than in water. We have um, eyes that are adapted for in-air vision, whereas otter eyes are amphibious and they are adapted to see well both underwater and in air. In dim light, it looks like their acuity is better in air than in water. Very few studies have been done um, with any otter, and in fact, no studies have been done specifically with North American river otters. So a lot of these studies, I'm talking about different species of otters, and we are extending what we know about those species to North American river otters. Another thing you might wanna know about is color vision in otters. Um, can they see colors? Do they see colors the same way humans do? Well, one way to study that is by training an otter to discriminate between different stimuli. And this study that was published in 2011 showed that a couple of otters could discriminate between various colors and gray, um, and they could discriminate between blue and green, and they could discriminate between blue and red, but they could not discriminate between green and red. So this was a behavioral study showing that otters had um, an issue with this particular type of discrimination. So the other way that you can study uh, color vision in any species is by looking at the cone cells that are contained within their retina. So human retinas contain three types of cone cells. You have blue cones, green cones, and red cones you see in that top graph. Um, and what we know about otter vision from studying uh, the retinas of European river otters and sea otters is that they lack the red cones that humans have. So they have blue and green cones, but no red cones. And that makes them um, possessing dichromatic color vision. So our color vision is called trichromatic or three cones, and they have two cones or dichromatic color vision. So what that looks like then, you can look at the bar with, that I've got the arrow next to. Um, if we see red, they see something that might be looking like yellowish or brownish or perhaps gray they can still discriminate potentially red from yellow or blue, but they're not gonna see red in the same way we're gonna see red. In fact, uh, most mammals have dichromatic color vision. So if you have a pet dog, what your dog sees is different than what you see. And here's a depiction here of what you would see if you're looking at a collection of dog toys and what a dog would see. 
So instead of red, you're seeing kind of a brownish or maybe a yellowish um, type hue. And otters in this sense are similar to your pet dog. So there was a study done specifically with North American river otters where a researcher looked at their ability to discriminate between uh, pairs of black and white stimuli, such as a black uh, square versus a white square, or in the red box you see a black plus versus uh, sort of a black bow tie. And it was found that uh, two otters were able to successfully discriminate between all these different pairs of stimuli. But um, there were some individual differences between the otters, which you'll also see in our otters in my studies. And um, importantly, there was no effort to explore which object features might have been used by the otters. So we don't know from this one study whether otters were using shape or size or the brightness or the color or what aspect of those stimuli they were actually picking up on. So in my very first study, I looked at um, North American river otters' ability to discriminate between 2D objects varying in shape and color. And this study is published and you can find it on my website um, under the uh, publications um, area and all my other publications. So if you're interested in reading more, please find it there. In this study, uh, I was interested in learning about whether otters could discriminate between two objects, if they originally were trained to discriminate between two objects with multiple cues, if you take away some of those features, are they still able to discriminate between the stimuli? So for example, you can train an otter to discriminate between a blue triangle and a red circle. They could be using the color, the shape, the size, the brightness, um, or other things about the uh, objects to make that discrimination. You could then test them with a blue triangle and blue circle in which they have no color cues, only shape cues. Can they still do it? Or you can give them two hexagons. One is blue and one is red. In this case, they have no shape cues because they're both hexagons, but they do have color. Can they do it? So my second question was, if um, I give them these two types of test probe stimuli, will they show a preference for using either shape and color? In other words, shape or color, excuse me. In other words, will they be better at blue triangle versus blue circle when they have shape available versus blue hexagon versus red hexagon when all they have is color available? Do they prefer to use shape or color to make the discrimination? So our otter subjects for this study were Heather and Sarah, 14-year-old females at the time of the study, and Sailor, who was 10 at the time of the study. This study took um, several years to complete, uh, but the majority of the testing and training was in over a two-year period. It takes a long time to do animal research, usually months to years to do any one project. So the type of method we used here is called two alternative force choice, which is a fancy name for, I'm gonna give you two things and you need to pick one. So in this case, I'm showing you an example with a yellow square and a red circle. So the yellow square, let's call that the S plus, that's the positive stimulus. That means if the animal walks towards it and chooses it, they're gonna get a food reward. The S minus is the negative stimulus. Here we're going to use the red circle for that. Um, that means if the animal chooses it, they get no reward. They also get no punishment. We never use any punishment. We only use rewards in our study. Um, sometimes a timeout could be used, but we didn't use that either. All we used was food rewards um, if the animal approached their S plus. So in two alternative force choice, you only ever have two objects. Um, but they have to switch sides because you don't want the animal to believe that if I always go to the right, I'm going to get fed, or if I always go to the left, I'm going to get fed. So ha on half the trials, the S plus is on the right side, and on the other half of the trials, the S plus is on the left side. So here are the S plus and S minus stimuli that we used for Sarah, Heather, and Sailor. Sarah's S plus was the yellow square, her S minus was the red circle, 
Heather's S plus was the red circle, her S minus was the blue triangle, and Sailor's S plus was the blue triangle, and his S minus was the red circle. So here you see a picture of Sarah in the very early stages of the study when we were using um, the metal stimuli before we transitioned into pictures of stimuli. And you can see her in the eco center coming up to that main central window about to touch her S plus. Sarah was our video star for this experiment. She was very good on camera. So I want to tell you a little bit about this experimental setup and then show you a really short video so you can see how the different trials worked here. This was all happening in the eco center or um, behind the eco center. So for Heather and um, Sarah, the setup was that Katina would stand outside near the stump and um, they would, the otter would start the trial standing up or standing near the stump um, on land. And uh, while um, the otter was working with the Katina over on, on land, sometimes doing various behaviors while we got set up for the um, experiment, we inside, my students and I, um, served as the recorders and experimenters for this study. We would be setting up the stimuli and um, when we were ready to go, and you see a picture of the blue triangle and the red circle, so this is a, this is a Heather trial. Remember, she's supposed to go to the red circle. Uh, what would happen is um, first um, Heather would stand up on the stump and Katina would point to the window and say target and then the otter jumps into the water and would then come and touch her nose to the glass next to the stimulus she chooses and we would be on a walkie-talkie inside and we would tell Katina correct or wrong and if the otter was correct then uh, we would go ahead and um, tell Tina correct, and she would feed, uh, throw a fish in and feed Heather or Sarah fish. And then um, the otter would loop back around, climb up on land, and we'd get set up for the next trial. So here's the short video, and you're gonna see um, Heather up there on the stump, and she is next to Katina. She's gonna get sent in, she's gonna make her choice, and then you're gonna see a student research assistant um, removing the stimuli to get set up for the next trial. You're also going to hear um, the recorder who's talking to the experimenter to make sure that she remembers which side the otter is supposed to go to so she can indicate whether the otter was correct or wrong. The circle was on the left. Correct. For trial six, the circle. So there you see um, Heather uh, eating her fish reward and she's going to come back on shore and she'll walk around and get back next to Katina and then we'll do the next trial there. So we had a different experimental setup for Sailor, 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 sorry. Um, Sailor had to be worked in protected contact, um, which means that there has to be a mesh barrier between um, the zookeeper and the animal while they're doing their training. And so Sailor was in the off exhibit area. He was in um, a number of pens that were connected by gates. And he started out in what we call the ITI position, which stands for inter trial interval position. And he would stand there with Katina while the students were getting set up by hanging the stimuli on um, the pen and getting ready for the first trial. And then Tina would send in Sailor to the, to the experimental area and tell him to target. He comes in, he stands up on his hind paws and he chooses the target that he um, is indicating. Um, and then if it is in fact his S plus, which is the blue triangle, then we would call out correct. And he, would, he knows that he needs to run back to his ITI position. Um, if he is correct, he gets a clicker from Tina, which is indicating that a reward is about to come. And once he reaches um, the mesh, then he gets his food reward, and then we set up for the next trial. So here is a quick video of how a sailor trial would work. Trial five, ready? So you see that Sailor got 
a click that was telling him, yes, you're correct. And so he knew when he came over to the ITI position, he was gonna get a fish reward. And while he's eating that fish reward, we get set up for the next trial. Remember that the S plus has to be on both the left and the right um, side. So we follow a random schedule telling us which side to put that S plus on for either of the, any of the otters. If you're interested in um, watching a slightly longer video about this study, uh, the BBC did a documentary and you can find a clip on the web of um, the host of that program on otters who is interviewing me about this task and you can get that on the website. So back to the study, um, remember that the training stimuli were a red circle and a blue triangle and for Heather, um, it was a red circle and for Sailor, it was a blue triangle. We also had um, Sarah who had her um, square that was yellow. But Sarah actually didn't um, progress to the testing stage because she had some health issues. So she stepped out um, after the training stage, but she was successful in the training. For the test probes, we had a number of uh, stimuli pairs that would test the otters on whether they could use only shape to make the decision, such as the black circle versus the black triangle. Um, and we had uh, a number of stimuli pairs that would test the otters to see if they could use only color, like the uh, red circle versus the blue circle. In that case, they're both circles, so you can't use shape, all you have is color to make the decision. So all three of our river otters were successful in learning to discriminate between their S plus and their S minus. So when they had a number of cues available like color and shape and brightness and size, they were all successful to the tune of about 85% correct was their overall accuracy. There were some slight individual differences um, in their training, but they all managed to clear the bar of 75% correct, which is the criterion we use to move on to testing. Speaking of testing, here are the test results. So I'm showing you the stimuli again, so you can remember uh, what stimuli they were seeing for both the training and the test trials. We mixed in uh, training trials to the test phase because we wanted to ensure that the otters continued to remember the original discrimination between red circle and blue triangle. And if you look at the graph, you can see that they did. Heather is the circles and sailors represented by the triangles. And you can see both Heather and sailor were far above chance, which would be 50%. If you were guessing at a two alternative course choice task, you'd be at 50%, that would be chance. So they were well above chance, meaning that they remembered that training discrim discrimination all the way through the test. Now looking at the test uh, trials, you see that Heather was significantly better than chance for both the color test probes and the shape test probes. And there was no difference between those two types. So she did not have a preference for using either color or shape to make the discrimination. Heather did about 50 test sessions. Sailor, on the other hand, only got to do about 12 test sessions because he uh, joined the experiment a little bit later than the girls. And we only had time to give him 12 test sessions after he was trained. And you can see that overall, he was not significantly better than chance for either of the test trial types, although there were many trials where he was above chance. Um, but statistically speaking, um, Sailor's results were not as good as Heather's, but we did find that Heather could do the task quite well. So in conclusion, for this study, we learned that otters can certainly um, discriminate between stimuli that vary in shape and color and other attributes, and that Heather could use either color or shape to discriminate between the objects, and she didn't have a preference for either. This also provided some first preliminary evidence for color vision in North American river otters, which had never been tested before um, for color vision. Um, and you may have picked up that we did use um, red, although you know that they probably, if they do have dichromatic color vision, they saw the red versus blue as more of like a brownish, yellowish versus blue, but they were still successful in discriminating between um, those two stimuli. 
So I want to tell you quickly about the study that we are currently engaged in on categorization of two-dimensional objects. And this study was led by my student, Jessica Wegman, who is who has graduated as of this month with her bachelor's degree at RIT. And she will be joining me for her master's degree in my lab at RIT. Um, of course, Katina was instrumental in this research. And I had many, many students who have helped and will help in the future on this project. So categorization is a process where objects are mentally grouped together based on defining features. So if you had to split these, this group of objects into two categories, how would you do it? Just think for a second, what would you do with these eight pictures of animals? How could you split them in two ways? Well, one way you could do it is you could have a bird category and a fish category. You could have also come up with a category not based on shape or species, but categories based on color. So you could have said, I'm gonna put the cool colors in one category and the warm colors in another. Well, what is categorization good for? Well, it's a process that all animals use to help them identify food and predators and help them to put new objects into categories such as safe versus dangerous so that they know how to react to things that they've never seen before. If they can categorize them, then they can successfully react to them and act on that knowledge. This has been studied with lots of animals like pigeons, fish, sharks, monkeys, baboons, and chimps, but never in river otters. So that's why we wanted to study categorization in otters. Um, we think it may be important for how they identify prey. So our two subjects were Heather and Sailor, who at the time we started last year were 16 and 12. And we used the same experimental setups that we used in the past experiment. So um, you can Think of those videos I just showed you. The trials are set up um, pretty much exactly the same. For the stimuli, we transitioned from using full color um, shapes that were filled in. Remember the blue uh, triangle and the red circle? We transitioned them to colored outlines of shapes. And then after they were good at uh, an outline of a red circle and an outline of a blue triangle, we transitioned them to black and white outlines because here we're only interested in shape categorization to start with. And then um, after they pass that training phase, you can see the different test uh, shapes that we used. We took the circle and we modified it into an oval and we turned it on its side and tilted it. And then we took the circle and we gave it straight sides and modified it into a hexagon and octagon. And then we took that triangle and we stretched it um, and we squashed it. Um, and we changed its sides and we gave it round uh, corners and we wanted to know, can um, Heather and Sailor still recognize these ovals and these stretch triangles as being in the same category as their original training stimuli? So in the first um, experiment that we did, uh, we found that both Heather and Sailor were successful at categorizing all those slightly modified circles into the circle category and all those modified triangles into the triangle category. So you can see overall Heather's performance was higher than Sailor, but they were both significantly better than Chance. So they, they maintained their ability to discriminate between the perfect circle and the equilateral triangle. That is shown in the solid blue bars. And then the diagonal blue bars show you how well they did with um, the modified stimuli like the ovals and the right triangles. And they did just as well with the modified stimuli as they did with their training stimuli. So then we wanted to make it a little bit harder and more interesting. We came up with some line drawings of objects that are circular in nature versus triangular in nature. And we wanted to see um, whether the otter, in this case, sailor, um, sadly, Heather uh, passed away at the end of last summer. So we, um, we moved forward with Sailor. And so we wanted to know if Sailor would, if say presented with the apple versus the tent, will he correctly choose the tent? Because he's supposed to go to, to anything triangular as his S plus. So those were the different types of test probes we used and we paired them all in various ways. So it was cloud versus hat. And, 
um, apple versus hat and baseball versus hat. So Sailor got all possible pairings of these different stimuli. And what we found our first time trying this is that Sailor maintained his discrimination of the training stimuli. In other words, um, he was able to discriminate between the perfect circle and the equilateral triangle. He continued to know how to do that. He remembered how to do that, but he was uh, at exactly 50% in terms of categorizing those novel line drawings. So he wasn't able to respond to those triangular stimuli the same way he responded to his training triangle. And we think one of the reasons for that is because we didn't really give him a lot of exposure to those novel line drawings um, before we started the study. So we're actually gonna try this again, where we have a longer training period where he gets um, more of those line drawings of real world objects incorporated into his training before he gets retested is we think Sailor may know how to do this, but it may have been an issue in the way that we presented um, the stimuli to him. So, so far what we know about this study, which is still um, in progress, is that uh, the two otters uh, were able to categorize the novel geometric shapes. Sailor thus far could not categorize uh, the line drawings, but we're gonna try again. And we're also planning future tests with 2D photos of real world 3D objects. So instead of just line drawings, we'll have black and white photos of oranges and pizzas and ice cream cones like you see here on this slide. So I'd like to acknowledge the Seneca Park Zoo staff that helped to make this research possible. The many, many RIT students who have helped me over the past eight years. And of course, the funding agencies that supported this research. And then finally, um, again, if you want to go to my lab website, please feel free to read more about our research. And if you are an RIT student or about to be an RIT student, please contact me. I am always looking for more research assistance to help with this study. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thanks, Carrie. Really appreciate it. Um, we are almost out of time, so I just I want to ask you one question that I think that, that is an important one is the role of zoos in your research because you've worked with a lot of uh, different species of, of animals and and you also said that you need to have multi year longer studies right and and so I just wonder if you can talk for a minute about the importance of zoos in your research. Yes, of course. Um, zoos are critical for my research. Um, there aren't a lot of places that have uh, otters available um, in research labs. Um, there's quite a few exotic species that you can only find in zoos and aquaria. And so those places are critical research partners for researchers like myself. And the um, long-term cooperation I've had from the Seneca Park Zoo is instrumental in learning anything about otters. And I'm especially grateful for my partnership with Katina Wright, who is the zookeeper that does all of the training. And it's her enthusiasm and passion for this research that keeps it going year after year. As I mentioned, we've been working now together for at least eight years. Um, and it all started when she came up to me um, when I was doing one of these uh, lunch and learns for zoo docents. And she um, had been training otters for a couple of years and she said, well, your research with orangutans sounds neat, but how about doing some research with otters? So I said, sure, why not? That sounds great. And so this, uh, this partnership began uh, between RIT and Seneca Park Zoo. And so I, I can't really say enough about, um, you know, the role of zoos in this kind of research is just, is simply critical. I couldn't do it without zoos. I see that Stuart has a, a question, but it's going to be a long one, and, and we've got another one started in about nine minutes. So unfortunately, we, re, we ran out of time, but I'm going to forward this to you with Stuart's email because he's one of the docents, uh, and it's about um, methodology and visual acuity and things. So I'll forward that by email, and, and Stuart will get that answered for you. But again, uh, Dr. Long, I really want to thank you for um, the, the partnership that you've created and you and Katina have created um, and all the work you do at the zoo. Uh, it's been really great and we look forward to many more years of you uh, working and, and figuring all this out. So thank you very much. Thank you. I hope that we can resume the research safely soon.
Yeah, exactly. So hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. We'll talk soon. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, we have another enrichment demo at 1 o'clock, and then Dr. Buckley from RIT will be coming on at 2 o'clock. So uh, make sure you check out our page and, and go register for those if you haven't already, and we'll see you then. Thanks again, Dr. Long. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye, everyone.